Legend says the prophet Sweet Medicine voiced a warning to the Cheyenne people here at Bear Butte in South Dakota. They were told before they ever saw a white person that there was a, a strange person coming from the east that would take over their lands, take over their customs and their people and their language and make them forget their ways. They said, how will we know? And they said, he said, well, he'll come from the east and he'll sweep you from the east to the west to the ocean, to the great waters. They said, well, we'll fight. We'll fight to keep our land. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, but it won't be any use. He felt sorry for them, but he told them that was their fate. The Cheyennes move west to escape the threat. Their lives become tied to the buffalo. As the great herds disappear, so does a way of life for the Cheyennes. It is a pain and a sadness undiminished by time. This is not abstract history to me. This is not something that's far away. This is not something that I read in books. This is something that's family history for me. And it's something that I cannot separate from the context of the time in which I live. Warned by their prophet sweet medicine of doom approaching from the east, the Cheyennes leave their farms and villages in Minnesota and begin following the setting sun west toward safety. The Cheyennes arrive on the southern plains in the early 1800s. Here they find a land that seems safe. Far from the east, the wild prairie also provides an answer to famine and hardship. A vast and seemingly inexhaustible source of food and shelter. Once we were on the high plains, our dependence was centered on the buffalo. The buffalo became the chief source of subsistence. The buffalo was used for food, for clothing, for shelter, and for tools. We understood how to live with them, and over time, our lives became so much a part of them that we were inseparable. And it was, after several generations, uh, virtually impossible to think of life without the buffalo. Here too, the Cheyennes find a great wealth of wild horses to catch and tame. Those horses certainly made it easier for us to go to the giant buffalo herds and, and uh, food supply was in much greater abundance. 
With an abundance of food and many hides, Cheyennes begin to trade with the new Americans. In the early 1820s, William Bent arrives from St. Louis and eventually builds a trading post along the upper Arkansas River known as Bent's Fort. William marries a Cheyenne woman. Their son, George Bent, remembers the busy trading post. When I was a boy, there were a hundred men employed at the fort. Something was always going on. The trade room was full of Indian men and women all day long. Others came just to visit and talk. A good blanket was traded at the fort for ten buffalo robes. The Cheyennes trade buffalo robes for manufactured goods like metal pots and knives, and for something that will change the destiny of their people. The rifle. We call the stick that speaks with a voice of thunder. It certainly increased our capability in supply and uh, the meat supply, and in terms of uh, making uh, buffalo more available to us. We were willing to continue the commerce that we had developed, uh, centering especially around Bent's Fort area. And then all of a sudden you had this, uh, what I would call the invasion. Spring and summer of 1858, 100,000 pioneers crossed the plains looking for gold. George Bent says his people are astonished. The tribes were discontented at the invasion of their hunting grounds, but were overawed by the great inrush of white men. They had never dreamed there were so many men in the whole white tribe. It uh, split the buffalo herds that were very necessary to our survival as a people uh, because buffalo will not cross over grazed out land. And if you think of just a road being grazed out, you say, well, why can't the buffalo cross over that? But the grazed out land was two or three miles in, in, in width. These new people don't just split the herds, they slaughter them. The Cheyennes are divided on how to deal with the growing number of immigrants. A warrior society among them known as the Dog Soldiers is determined to fight. The young men of this band were very wild and reckless, great raiders and hard to control. In this way, they get the rest of the tribe into trouble. These young men would make a raid and get out of the way, and the troops would come and punish some other band of Cheyennes for what dog soldiers had done. The strongest voice for peace among the Cheyennes belongs to Chief Black Kettle. Black Kettle signs a treaty in 1861 agreeing to a reservation, but he is only one of 44 Cheyenne chiefs. Most refuse to accept the reservation, and Cheyennes continue to roam the plains. It is something the settlers will not accept. They wish to get the Indians out of their uh, neighborhood altogether simply uh, because, number one, uh, Indians constituted in their mind uh, a threat, and number two, they did not wish to share the resources of this land uh, with Indian occupants. And nowhere really was coexistence uh, in the cards. The demands for removing the Cheyennes from the plains are loudest in the new settlement of Denver. Colorado's territorial governor, John Evans, listens. A conscientious and ambitious man, 
he voices his concerns to the U.S. Army Command in Washington. The Cheyenne are in strong force on the plains. I feel confident that they will wipe out our sparse settlements in spite of any home force we could muster against them. Evans finds a strong supporter in Colorado's military commander, Colonel John Shivington. A former Methodist minister, Shivington gave up his praying command for a fighting one. I believe it to be right or honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill Indians that would kill women and children. Damn any man that is in sympathy with Indians. Shivington genuinely entertained the conviction that all Indians needed to be uh, annihilated. He was a true exterminationist. But in this, he simply was reflective of the attitude of the Denver population following the Hungate murder. June 1864, Denver is thrown into a panic. Rancher Ward Hungate, his wife and two children are murdered, not by Cheyennes, but by a band of Arapahoes. The family's mutilated bodies are put on display in the city. The War Department authorizes Colonel Shivington to raise an additional volunteer regiment, the Colorado 3rd Cavalry. 100-day militiamen are recruited from the city saloons with one purpose, to kill Indians. As Evans and Shivington clamor for war, Chief Black Kettle urges peace. At great risk, given the mood of the settlers, Black Kettle rides into Denver to talk with Governor Evans and Colonel Shivington. All we ask is that we may have peace with the whites. We want to take good tidings home to our people, that we may sleep in peace. I want all the chiefs of the soldiers here to understand that we may not be mistaken by them for enemies. While Evans insists he cannot make peace, military authorities instruct Black Kettle to take his people to Sand Creek in southeastern Colorado. The old chief leaves Denver believing that peace has been made. The bands under Black Kettle were camped here because they had camped here before and they, they felt safe, they felt protected. And they came here to camp thinking that they were under the protection of the United States Army. But the Army's representative, Colonel Shivington, has other plans. He commands a volunteer force that has yet to fight a single battle. Mocked as the bloodless third in Denver newspapers, his 100-day soldiers are about to be mustered out of service. Shivington secretly plans an attack on the Cheyenne village at Sand Creek. The bloodless third is about to become bloody. November 28, 1864. Confident that they are at peace, Black Kettle and his people camp along Sand Creek. That night, the village holds a feast. The games and dancing last far into the night. The peace is shattered at dawn the next day when 700 members of the Colorado 3rd under Colonel John Shivington rip into Black Kettle's sleeping village of 500 Cheyennes. Instructions were given to these chiefs that should they ever encounter United States Cavalry, all they would have to do was raise the United States flag in that direction with a white truce flag underneath, symbolizing a peaceful village. On November 29th of 1864, 
That was done early dawn. Frantically, Black Kettle tries to reassure his people. The women and children were fleeing. He called them and told them to come stand around him, that they would be safe. But even the American flag and a white flag of peace that day did not stop the butchery that occurred here. just couldn't believe what was happening. He thought it was some great big mistake and that uh, the American flag would uh, uh, signal the true character of his village. I'm sure that there were all kinds of conflicting emotions that he must have experienced as, as he stood there and, and, and called his children around him, and ultimately realizing that the 100-day militia was intent on extermination of a people and their way of life. One of those in Black Kettle's village on Sand Creek is George Bent. They were nothing but a mob. They killed all the wounded, and scalped, and mutilated the dead bodies. Most of us who were hiding in the pits had been wounded, and there we lay all that bitter, cold day. At last, we crawled out with the blood frozen on our bodies. That was the worst night I ever went through. Nearly 200 Cheyennes lie dead. More than two-thirds are women and children. Colonel Chivington, a week before the massacre at Sand Creek, was asked at a public event, do you mean that the hostile Cheyennes should be killed even as to their women and children? And he said, yes. Knits make lice. That is what happened right after that at Sand Creek. The babies were cut from the wombs of the mothers because knits make lice. That is how hated and despised our people were. Somehow, Black Kettle escapes the slaughter at Sand Creek. Colonel Shivington and the Colorado 3rd return to Denver as conquering heroes. The uh, old stories in the press at that time, they called it a battle too, and of course he didn't tell them that he had killed a bunch of women and kids. He told them the glorious um, victory over uh, fighting warriors, even way while he and his men were parading uh, parts of mutilated women, such as um, cut off breasts and uh, mutilated parts of mutilated men, uh, their uh, scrotums and scalps and so on, they were parading through the streets. Denver newspapers, which had mocked the Colorado Third, now praise it. Among the brilliant feats of arms in Indian warfare, the recent campaign of our Colorado volunteers will stand in history with few rivals and none to exceed it in final results. To the third stars! 
What was done at Sand Creek reflected the dominant public opinion of Denver at that time, a public opinion uh, shaped by the hysteria produced by the Hungate massacres and uh, the depredations on the travel route during the summer, a public opinion nonetheless that was not founded on solid reality. In Denver, theater patrons applaud a display of Cheyenne scalps. Shivington and the now bloody Thirdsters are mustered out with honors. But as the truth about Sand Creek spreads across the country, disgust and outrage grow. The government begins three separate investigations into the massacre. One of the many voices denouncing Shivington belongs to one of his former officers, Captain Silas Soule. He writes to his mother about Sand Creek. I was present at a massacre of 300 Indians, mostly women and children. It was a horrible scene and I would not let my company fire. see little children on the knees begging for their lives have their brains beat out like dogs. Soul testifies against Shivington, but in the emotional climate of Denver, he is a target. Twice attempts are made on his life. A third succeeds on April 23, 1865, just nine days after the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. Soul is called Colorado's first victim of political assassination. Shivington is never charged for the crimes at Sand Creek and defends his actions there for the rest of his life. Plains, the wounded and terrified survivors of Sand Creek join other bands. News of the treachery spreads quickly. If this is how the soldiers treat a peaceful village, what hope do any of the people have now? Cheyenne people were defending a way of life, their hunting grounds, something that was being turned into farmland. I think all those things have to be taken into consideration especially when incidents like Sand Creek have taken place, then the only thing that you can think about at that point in watching your, your very own family getting slaughtered is vengeance. Sand Creek changed Cheyenne into the most rootless warriors that could ever walk any face of the earth. There was nothing going to stop them from getting, you know, from fighting for what occurred to their people. I'm sure to the dog soldiers, the provisions of the treaty had been violated. You know, an act of war uh, had been committed. And therefore, uh, you know, they were at war with the United States government. The leader of the dog soldiers is Bull Bear. Nearly seven feet tall, he is an imposing war chief. Whites are foxes, and no peace can be made with them. I have tried to live in peace, but the soldiers have burned Cheyenne camps, stolen our horses, and killed our people. 
These rare drawings seized from a dog soldier camp graphically record Cheyenne vengeance for the massacre at Sand Creek. Winter, 1865. Attacking supply wagons and settlements, dog soldiers spread death and destruction. Denver is completely cut off. The government calls on two Civil War heroes, Generals William Tecumseh Sherman and Philip Sheridan, to subdue the Cheyennes. These were two of the Civil War's most successful generals, and they achieved their success. Sherman in Georgia, Sheridan in the Shenandoah Valley, through uh, measures that have been described as total war. Making war on the entire enemy population. Destroying the uh, enemy's possessions, their shelters, their food supplies, and uh, thereby destroying the enemy's will to resist. Sherman and Sheridan prepare for total war against the Cheyennes. Sheridan is a favorite with settlers. Many echo his often stated belief, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. But fighting the Cheyennes is very different from fighting Confederates. The dog soldiers prove an elusive enemy, vanishing after each attack. But a new pressure is building to settle the Indian War. The railroads are coming. The Iron Horse brings even more people west into Cheyenne lands. I think it was impossible for anyone to have envisioned the far-reaching consequences of this Conestoga wagon-sized iron horse and the people it would bring in the great numbers it would bring, greater than the buffalo, greater than any of the Indian nations, and with devastating tools of destruction. The government realizes that if the railroads are to continue across the southern plains, the Cheyennes must be moved. In October 1867, a treaty council convenes on Medicine Lodge Creek in Kansas. Black Kettle, Bull Bear, and other Cheyenne chiefs are persuaded to sign a treaty promising to move their people to a reservation in Indian Territory once the buffalo disappear from the southern plains. There was an absolute certainty that they were signing something that would preserve those rights, preserve those hunting grounds, preserve that territory for the Cheyenne people. And what was the exchange? That there would be no more massacres. These were treaties of peace and friendship. Peace attained at Medicine Lodge lasts only a year. July 1868, the dog soldiers raid settlements in Kansas, killing 15 settlers. Many Cheyennes refuse to accept the treaty and vow to fight to keep the buffalo lands. Even members of Black Kettle's band are becoming hard to control. I have always done my best to keep my young man quiet, but some 
will not listen. We want peace. My camp is now on Washita, and I have there about 180 lodges. I speak only for my people. I cannot control the Cheyennes north of the Arkansas. Generals Sherman and Sheridan plan a winter campaign against the Cheyennes when the people are less mobile and their ponies in poor condition. To lead the newly formed 7th Cavalry against the Cheyennes, Sheridan calls on another hero of the Civil War, General George Armstrong Custer. November 27, 1868, almost four years to the day since the Sand Creek Massacre. Custer and the 7th Cavalry followed the tracks of a Cheyenne war party to a village camped on the Washita River. The village chief is Black Kettle. That took place in the morning. He said it was kind of a misty or foggy that morning. They became aware when they heard these dogs, their dogs barking, kind of made them take notice. Within 10 minutes, Custer and the soldiers take the village, killing 100 Cheyennes. Among the dead, Black Kettle and his wife. Descendant of the uh, Chief Black Kettle. All he wanted was was to live and to be left alone and to uh, to see his little children and grandchildren grow up, live a life, enjoy this life that God gave us. Custer deals the Cheyennes a crippling blow at Washita. As the 1860s draw to a close, most Cheyennes on the Southern Plains surrender to the reservation. It has been a decade of enormous change for the people. Even the fierce dog soldiers face defeat in a major battle with U.S. troops at Summit Springs in Colorado Territory. On the plains, the buffalo are disappearing. It will be a threat to this most valuable animal that draws the Cheyennes once again to war. The Cheyennes find life on the reservation unbearable. Food was not that plentiful. Even the kind of food that was given to them was very foreign. I mean, can you imagine having to suddenly live on a diet of rice and you didn't know what rice was in the first place? And you could only look at it based upon your own cultural experiences and saw that it was white. And he says, ha, ah, those look like maggots. Indian agent John Miles warns of chronic food shortages. We now have at this agency over 500 lodges of Cheyenne and Arapaho. Our coffee, sugar and bacon is exhausted and the beef contractor is considering whether he can furnish any more beef. 
It is very important now that these people be fed. It was an extremely difficult adjustment um, moving on to the reservation. Because here they were confined to a certain area. But something that was very essential to their way of life uh, was, was starting to vanish, and that was the buffalo. In the East, buffalo hides become fashionable. The huge demand creates a booming business for buffalo hunters. The Cheyenne were desperate by this time. It must have been just uh, unbelievable to them that the thousands and thousands of buffalo that had once roamed the plains were now virtually gone. General Sherman and Sherrod then could not help but look with favor upon the extermination of the buffalo. As early as 1866, General Sherman recognized that every buffalo killed made his job that much easier because as the buffalo diminished, the Indians would have no alternative but to submit to uh, the U.S. government. In 1870, there are more than 15 million buffalo roaming the plains. Five years later, there are less than one million. Everywhere they went, they could just smell all this rotted flesh of the buffalo uh, that they had that had, they had been slaughtered. It just really, really got to them because their people were starving, and here was all these carcasses, every place. They just uh, took the hides and, the, and the, left the rest of the buffalo to rot. An angry Cheyenne chief named Little Robe says, Your people make big talk and sometimes make war if an Indian kills a white man's ox to keep his wife and children from starving. What do you think my people ought to say when they see their buffalo killed by your race when you are not hungry? They were at the point to where they were going to fight to the bitter end. If they were going to die, they might as well die fighting. In 1874, many Cheyennes leave the reservation and attack a buffalo hunting camp in Texas. The Red River War begins. It was the last uh, effort of the Southern Plains tribes, including the Cheyennes, to uh, rebel against the reservation, to reassert the independence of the old way of life, and I guess to register a uh, violent protest against the extermination of the buffalo. The violence spreads from Texas to Kansas. It's been 10 years since the Sand Creek Massacre. In that time, the Cheyennes have watched settlers swarm over the plains. They have been killed by soldiers, their homes and property destroyed the buffalo decimated. My great-grandmother, she said in Cheyenne that the, their world became full of fear. 
They couldn't be at ease any place. They remembered this place that they used to camp, and they felt like uh, they, they would be safe there. They took refuge there. The place is Palo Duro Canyon in Texas. Its deep valleys have sheltered the people during many winters. In September 1874, the weary Cheyennes set their camps here. U.S. Army troops scoured the plains looking to punish the Cheyennes and return them to the reservation. Colonel Ranald McKenzie surprises the Cheyennes at Palo Duro Canyon. The Cheyennes have no chance to resist and flee in panic. Their homes and food supplies are burned. In Mackenzie's most damaging blow, the Cheyenne's entire pony herd, some 1,400 prized horses, are rounded up. All are shot. This was the last gasp of the Cheyennes. Henceforth, they accommodated to the reservation, settled on the reservation, and made the best they could of the conditions of reservation life. They were a poor people, finally, who turned themselves in, who saw that the white man was here, and he's here to stay. And how do you live from him from that point on? It wasn't easy. They fought nearly to the point of extinction. And when they saw that the buffalo were gone and the last buffalo on the southern plains were gone, yeah, they saw that, that part of their history coming to a close and they went in. One of the last to come in is Chief Medicine Water. His great-grandson is John Sipes. He loved his people, he loved his land, he loved Mother Earth, and he was willing to die for all of that. And I think even though he didn't die from the soldiers, I think, I think he died when he came in to give up. I think a part of him died that time period. To me, he holds a very special place in my heart, and he's must have been one tough grandpa. The open land the Cheyennes love has changed, and so must they. There are no horses to ride, no buffalo to hunt. The Cheyennes know that their old free life is gone forever. They return to the reservation to begin the new life. Today, Sand Creek is privately owned. Visitors, even the Cheyennes whose relatives died here, must pay a fee. Sand 
Some of the victims at Sand Creek were decapitated. Their skulls sent east for study. The Smithsonian Institution is now returning the skulls to the Cheyenne people for burial. It's hard for me even as a person that loves life and, and people to say, I can forgive what happened here. Maybe I can forgive, but I don't, that doesn't mean that I can forget. Today, Cheyennes remember what was lost, but they also remember what could never be taken from them. The spirit of the Cheyenne people was never broken despite all of this, despite nightmare images and memories that are burned into the hearts and souls and brains of every living Cheyenne person, despite all of this, our spirit has never been broken. We are still a tribal people who tenaciously cling to our traditional ways. Zetistas is that the Cheyenne are still alive today. <laughs>